Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about Navier-Stokes equation, um, which comes from uh, a force balance on a differential fluid element, just like we did for um, Bernoulli's equation. But for Bernoulli's equation, we assumed an inviscid fluid. And here we're going to relax that assumption. And so what we end up with is we end up with all the pressures, just like we had before. So a, a normal force here, normal force here, normal force here, normal force on all the back faces too. We get a, a mass times a gravity here, mg. Um, remember mass, remember all these things are differential fluid elements, so they're all differential volumes or differential masses. So in this case, it'd be a dx, dy, dz times a density. Um, we're going to assume, by the way, this our density does not change across our volume. Um, and then we're going to relax that inviscid assumption, which allows us to add shear stress. Just like that. Yeah. So when we add that in, we uh, again, we're, we're doing a force balance on this differential fluid element, which means we're basically applying F equals MA, right? Um, so when we apply F equals MA here, um, we use something called the total derivative. Remember I told you earlier that the acceleration in a Eulerian point of view for a fluid is equal to this. Well, this is our acceleration. This is our mass. Well, it's a mass per volume, but everything in here is going to be per volume. Um, we have a differential, if we just look in the x direction, by the way, a differential pressure with respect to x, so a dp dx. We have a rho times a g in the x direction, so however much our gravity is in the x direction. Um, so that's our mass force. This is our, remember, our mass times acceleration. Our, we have a pressure force, a mass force, or a weight. And here is where our shear stress comes in. We're going to model our shear stress as a Newtonian fluid. So we have a constant mu, that's our viscosity, times our shear stress, which is a, remember, shear stress was d u d y. Well, that shows up right there. Only we're worried about the change in shear stress with position. So it actually becomes the second derivative. Okay, now it, because it's also three dimensions, we have to include the other dimensions in here, so it, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but this the the tau that we're familiar with, tau is equal to mu times du dy dy is shows up here, like I said. But we're just worried about the change in tau, so d tau dx or, or dy in this case. So then that would equal uh, d squared u dy squared. Um, so this is just a force balance in the x direction, like I said, um, and we can do that for the y and the z direction. Um, so here is, I didn't even write it out, but we can. So some of the forces in the z direction is going to be equal to mass times the total derivative of velocity with respect to time. And again, it's exactly the same thing. We have, uh, we have acceleration here. Um, times a mass, times a change in pressure with y, times a, uh, a body force, basically. So gravity is our only body force we're considering now, but you could include other ones like um, magnetic or electric forces. And then we also have, again, our shear stress, but this time in the y direction. Um, so we can label all these different parts certain things. Remember I told you this was the acceleration in an Eulerian point of view. Well, we can, it has a name, it's called the total derivative. We are going to um, derive this total derivative in a later lecture, right before we start doing control volume approaches, because we need it to start looking at um, control volumes and Reynolds transport theorem. This is a pressure gradient here, specifically in x direction. Like I said, this is a body force which in this case is gravity. Um, and in this case here, this is our uh, gradient of shear stress. So pressure gradient, shear stress gradient, um, that's what we got. So that's Navier-Stokes equation, equations. There's, well, you can write it as a single equation if you use vector notation, right? Um, here we have, and here we've written all three uh, components out.
And we can solve this for a limited number of systems. I, I can't remember how many it is. I think we have, there's 16 or 17 known solutions to Navier-Stokes equation or something like that. Um, CFD packages solve an approximation to Navier-Stokes equation. Um, and you can also, uh, I think there's commercial packages nowadays that allow you to do what they call direct numerical simulation of Navier-Stokes, but it's tremendously compu uh, computationally intensive. Um, so um, the reason why we're telling you about this and um, system of equations, Navier-Stokes equations, um, and making you solve them is, is really one reason only. And that is both CFD systems and you and us, whatever, will use the same boundary conditions. So when you go to model these and whatever job you have, or if you go take one of our um, CFD classes, there's a, we do have an applied computational fluid dynamics um, class now. Um, you'll be asked to apply boundary conditions to your uh, model. And those boundary conditions will be the same boundary conditions you apply here. So the first boundary condition that we have is called the no slip condition. And what it basically says is that the fluid velocity at a surface is equal to the velocity of that surface. Um, just as a side note, uh, so yeah, so what what this means is that, oh, I did not want to do that. What this means is that, right, if the fluid boundary is at rest, because let's say we're in a pipe, like, like this picture right here, um, if the fluid boundary is at rest, the fluid is at rest at that, at that surface, right? Um, if the fluid is moving with a velocity v in the y direction, right, like let's say this one we started moving with a v downwards, then that fluid at that surface, we would know its velocity is equal to v, which is tremendously useful, right? It's called a no-slip condition. Just as a side note, um, there are limited cases when this, when um, no-slip fails, let's say, um, and those are uh, rare gas, rarefied gas, so Um, basically, uh, like satellites in space kind of thing, rarefied gas, um, and then also, uh, very small length scales. Um, very small length scales. So for gases, these, these length scales are on the orders of, um, less than microns, and then with uh, liquids are on the order of a few nanometers. So very small length scales. Um, so this is a first order boundary condition. Um, we'll find out why it's called a first order boundary condition. We can also um, apply second order boundary conditions. So a second order boundary condition means we know where we set the shear stress. in a system. So in this case, we know here, because our velocity gradient at this point here, right in the middle, right, the velocity gradient is equal to zero here. So the gradient and the velocity is equal to zero. Is equal to zero. Um, therefore, the shear stress is equal to zero. So most often this is what we'll do. We'll set the shear stress equal to zero at a point when we have symmetry, for example. Um, due to symmetry. Um, the other case where uh, a zero shear stress shows up is, and we're gonna draw this now. So we're gonna draw, um, draw a solid surface that's motionless. And then um, running down that surface, we're going to have a liquid film. 
that is moving down. We're going to draw the uh, velocity profile. And what you're going to find, uh, what we're going to do here is it's basically, um, the important part is that right here at this surface, the gradient and the velocity, again, has to equal zero. Um, and then we call this a free surface. And what's happening is, is that this free surface of this liquid is pushing against something. It's just that the viscosity of air, which it's pushing against, is so low that we can neglect the shear stress that it creates. Um, now, there are some cases where you cannot do that. By the way, this is the symbol for a free surface. Um, there are some cases when you can't do that. For example, if you're analyzing the um, height of Lake Erie. I don't know how many of you guys get weather announcements on your phone. It's probably really making me feel old. But uh, my phone buzzes all the time when we have strong winds out of the um, southwest because the uh, shear stress due to wind on water is very low, right? But when you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of um, square kilometers of surface area to push on, you can actually produce a decent amount of stress, which pushes the water towards us and causes lake levels to rise uh, several feet. Uh, do you like how I mixed Imperial and uh, SI units there? Um, so anyway, uh, but effectively we're going to approximate free surface, so um, nothing to push against. So you don't have any shear stress there. And because the gradient is zero, we're basically saying that um, the derivative of the velocity with respect to position is zero, which is why we call it a second order boundary condition. Okay. All right. So that's our introduction. Um, the next thing we're going to do is a short problem. Um, but we're going to split that up into a second video. Um, but that short problem is going to be what we call Couette flow, right? So I'm just going to write it down here. That flow that we've been analyzing the shear stress for all year, we're actually going to solve for the velocity profile using Navier-Stokes equations. All right, that's the next video.